Uh, welcome, uh, participants, and uh, also thank uh, you, Andre, and the Chicago uh, branch of the Rudolf Steiner Chicago branch for uh, hosting this event. And I think uh, this is sort of an important topic. I've been working with it for many years and I think uh, these are the kind of things that we also uh, uh, bring with us from past incarnations uh, the sort of that draws us to these kinds of themes. Uh, last time I uh, shared an excerpt from uh, the last lectures that Steiner gave uh, on the subject uh, which was just a little before he uh, gave his very last address on the 28th of September, 1924. Uh, the 18 lectures that he gave on the Book of Revelation and uh, the priest, uh, which was uh, attended uh, by Christian community priests and the Forstunt members exclusively. And that was, I think, from uh, September 5th to the 22nd, I believe. So if you think of the 22nd, that was uh, like a week before the 28th when he stopped uh, giving lectures altogether uh, due to the progress of his illness. And you could say that uh, this illness had a great deal to do with the burning of the Gutianum, as well as uh, the following year, there was uh, what he described at the time as a poisoning. And uh, even though there's some controversy there, this was uh, in connection with the, uh, the uh, the renewal of the society the following year after the uh, burning of the Gutianum. And uh, it's as though at the New Year's turning of the year, it's as though there's sort of a battle going on between the progressive hierarchical beings centered around the Christ in our time in Michael and the adversarial uh, forces. But in this case, it's actually the human beings who've aligned themselves. So Rudolf Steiner was seen as a threat to the machinations or uh, plans that certain uh, secret societies, among them what uh, could be termed the brothers of the left as Rudolf Steiner called them, and among them were certain Freemasons and Jesuits who he said were responsible for the burning of the Gutianum. So uh, aside from the battle in the heavens, there is the earthly counterpart to that. And Rudolf Steiner was very much involved and gave us uh, many insights into uh, how we can understand this and participate in it. And that's part of this theme. So in that last uh, set uh, or lecture on this uh, book of Revelation, I took an excerpt, excerpt from that uh, cycle to the priests and it uh, spoke of the book of Revelation representing uh, early stage of initiation not for the individual, but for Christendom. And uh, by taking it in uh, and living into the imaginations that are really taken from the astral world, these seven seals, they uh, can bring about a change in our sleep life to where we find ourselves in the company of others 
who are also participants in this initiatory process, including the being of the beloved disciple who was the author. And I mentioned last time that there was in the raising of Lazarus, uh, a communion that occurred with the soul of John the Baptist who had been beheaded and was over lighting the disciples so that this raising from the dead brought about a communion that united representatives of the Cain and Abel stream. And these Jesuits and Freemasons who were responsible for burning the Gertianum represented backward Cain and Abel streams that saw what Rudolf Steiner was bringing as a threat to their agenda. And they didn't want this uh, communion. They didn't want to recognize this. And uh, this is the mystery of the two Johns that Steiner uh, spoke about. One being in the physical body, the other incorporated in them, in him. And both of them were around the year 30 years old. So they, this being a beloved disciple lived to be a little over a hundred years old, it said. So that was quite a long period of communion. And these two uh, branches of that incarnation then continue into the future. One, uh, Lazarus John becomes Christian Rosenkreutz and the uh, John the Baptist becomes uh, Raphael Novalis. And Rudolf Steiner spoke of how uh, this individuality would again be a part of the battle at the turn of the millennium that we're involved with now. So this is very sort of relevant to our time. Both of these currents that came from Novalis and Christian Rosenkreuz flowed into anthroposophy. So let me share my screen here. So one of the things I wanted to bring up uh, is that these seven seals that are depicted on this opening slide are not the seven seals that occur in the book of Revelation after the letters. So the sequence in the book of Revelation is you have the seven letters, and those are related to our uh, seven post-Atlantean ages. We're currently in the fifth and we're looking forward to the sixth, our age. Uh, it's the consciousness soul that's being developed and the sixth age will be the beginning of spirit self, which won't reach its full uh, measure of development until the future Jupiter condition, the next planetary condition. So I tried to emphasize how that's an important uh, work to prepare for that uh, coming uh, period. And Rudolf Steiner gave uh, a talk on preparing for the sixth epoch. Here I'm they're showing how there's a relationship uh, between the uh, seven apocalyptic seals or Rosicrucian seals uh, that uh, are based in this case on paintings that Rudolf Steiner gave sketches for. Uh, many of them have precursors uh, that were uh, there in the occult literature. Uh, Eliphas Levi, for example, 
had worked with some of them. The very last one is uniquely Rudolf Steiner's contribution that has to do with uh, what's often called the Grail seal. Now, in this uh, sequence, the these seven seals uh, really give an overview of the whole evolution of humanity. But they not only fit into these very large eons or mantavaras, which have uh, then periods in between that are the macrocosmic counterpart to the sleep state, uh, pralaya conditions, that uh, when it comes to the earth stage, uh, you see these two pillars, uh, Mercury and Mars, rather than there being one pillar for the earth in this sequence of pillars, there's two. And that uh, fourth seal should really be in between those two. The Mars pillar represents more the incarnational phase of earth evolution. The iron and the blood is a reflection of those forces. And the second half is the Mercury. That's the reascending impulse. Uh, the caduceus you see on that uh, capital expresses the reunion of opposites. The division of the sexes took place in the Lemurian time, which is uh, uh, the uh, third stage of Earth evolution. And that's where the division of the sexes uh, took place. And we're in the future approaching a time where there is a new androgyny. But uh, this new androgyny is uh, then raised to the level of the larynx. And uh, this forging of the grail sword has to do with this. The lost word of the Freemasons have to do with this. And uh, so there's many uh, mysteries involved in this micro logos, as one could call it. And the seals have to do with the world of imaginative consciousness, whereas the capitals have to do with the music of the spheres, the world of inspiration and tone. Tone creates form, like you see in the Cladni sound uh, forms that arise from, in its more primitive expression, running a uh, bow across a uh, metal plate that has uh, dust or sand on it. And uh, the dust then reconfigures itself based on the tones. And one could say that behind the whole physical universe is this world of Devikonic uh, tones. There's a lower and higher Devikon. And this, of course, works down into the etheric. So you have what's called the tone ether and the life ether, especially reach down into the physical uh, material world. And uh, these forms are manifestations of the metamorphosis that these uh, world of, of tones. And in the book of Revelation, it's the world of the trumpets as opposed to the seals. The seven seals are related to the world of imagination, the trumpets to the world of tone and sound and form. So we have then the descending sequence and the reascending uh, sequence. And uh, the goal of Earth evolution is to transform the old moon, the planet of wisdom, into the future Jupiter or New Jerusalem, the golden city, the planet of love uh, that we're called to prepare. Now, one of the things that uh, one can get from this graphic is you have at the top these larger stages, the Mantavaras, these great eons of planetary 
evolution and seven stages. And we're in that case in the fourth stage. But, uh, if we now, uh, that fourth stage being the earth, look to the next sequence of seven below it, then we have a recapitulation that goes on. The Polarian is a recapitulation of old Saturn, uh, the Hyperborean of old sun, the Lemurian of old moon, and the Atlantean is the first real earth stage. But we have now entered the post-Atlantean, which you can see at the very bottom there, the post-Atlantean stages. So those post-Atlantean uh, stages, the first four of them, uh, each of these periods are 2,160 years. The ancient Indian, uh, which was under the sign of the crab, I believe, uh, then comes the ancient version. It's a recapitulation of the Hyperborean. And then you have the Lemurian recapitulated in the Egypto-Chaldean Babylonian. That ends in 747 BC, which is when the Greco-Latin uh, period begins, the fourth Earth age, which a recapitulation of the Atlantean, which was the first Earth proper evolution. And now we're in the uh, the fifth, uh, called the Anglo-Saxon on here. Uh, it's uh, the consciousness soul period. Now, in this case, we're not recapitulating anymore. The fourth stage was the recapitulation of the Atlantean. And uh, it... Uh, then now leads to the next stage being not a recapitulation, but a kind of anticipation of the fifth stage above, which is the New Jerusalem, the golden city. So in our fifth stage, we're not recapitulating anymore. We're anticipating the future. And Rudolf Steiner indicated that that makes our time apocalyptic so that uh, the mysteries of initiation need to be renewed in order to enter into this period in the right way. So uh, the Anglo-Saxons uh, have a special predisposition uh, for the uh, consciousness soul development. And so they help to launch the Royal Society and the modern scientific endeavors connected with that. Francis Bacon was a major inspirer of that. And uh, they then also gave rise to the early stages of the Industrial Revolution where science is uh, manifest in technology. And much of what we're facing in our time uh, in terms of the onslaught of the adversarial forces have to do with technology. Uh, because uh, as one can see from this sequence, uh, the first uh, four stages are a descent. The fourth stage itself are a turning point. And then there is a excarnation process. So we're in the second half of Earth evolution where the Mercury forces are in the foreground, where there's an excarnating. That means uh, that we're approaching the time when the Earth will more and more be subject to the death forces. And these technological uh, developments are a reflection of that. Ariman is the Lord of death. Ariman is a being who lacks a heart. Uh, in the image of uh, this being that Steiner sculpted, he lacks the forehead, which is a new part of the brain development that uh, was initiated by the members of the highest hierarchy in the 15th century when the consciousness soul began. And at that same time, there was uh, what Rudolf Steiner spoke of as a 
uh, Michael's school in the heavenly world. But he says that thunder and lightning uh, came to expression in that time where the cherubim, seraphim, and thrones were uh, bringing about a new development in the human world that uh, resulted in a change in the configuration of the brain, uh, especially this forebrain uh, being sort of a new faculty and that there was a shift from the heart-centeredness within humanity that uh, allowed the old dreamy clairvoyance to continue through the Middle Ages. Now there was a shift to head consciousness as a preparation for the consciousness soul. And that then led to this scientific development, et cetera. So uh, we're preparing the next stage. And I spent some time uh, with this the last time. This is the age of Philadelphia. It's the age of Aquarius. Again, uh, 2,160 years is the period of time uh, for each of these ages. And ours began in 1413. Uh, so this is like uh, 3,200, something in that uh, range uh, when this begins. So it's not very far ahead of us in terms of uh, reincarnation and karma. Rudolf Steiner indicated that we generally incarnate at least once as a man, once as a woman in these uh, ages, and that there's something then new to take up and this masculine feminine incarnation are kind of counted as one because in the cosmos there is a striving towards balance however there are souls who have particular missions uh, like rudolf steiner who had numerous incarnations uh, in the male side of uh, human gender so that uh, he could then uh, bring his gifts to full fruition in our time, which is the period when the Michael age since 1879 has been in progress. So Rudolf Steiner was very much aligned to this Michael impulse, which is the earthly counterpart to the Michael school. Steiner indicated that Ariman was so concerned when this Michael school was underway that he created a counter Arimanic school in the subnature world. And so you could say many of those who are leading the charge in artificial intelligence and in the development of computer technology uh, participated in this Arimanic uh, schooling. So, uh, I'm not gonna read this over again now, uh, but these are the words that are written in the letter to the Church of Philadelphia, uh, which means brotherhood. And uh, this first seal at the left, you can see the hand uh, magnified there on the right. These are the seven stars that are depicted. So there's seven candlesticks that represent the seven churches, and then there's the seven stars that are said to be the angels uh, that overlight uh, and incorporate in these seven uh, ages uh, represented by the seven churches. So the first Ephesus church is goes back to the ancient Indian, the second to the ancient Persian, and uh, down to our age of Sardis and then Philadelphia. And then there's one more seventh afterwards, which would be considered the lukewarm. In Atlantis, it was the fifth stage was the ripe one that carried over via Ireland and the Manu uh, then took people into uh, Asia. Uh, to prepare the post-Atlantean epochs. In this period, it's the sixth age, the Philadelphia age, that will be the ripe one, that will then uh, prepare the seeds for the sixth great epoch. 
and which also has then seven ages. And in the larger picture that Steiner gave in the uh, Nuremberg cycle, I think it was uh, 1908 on the book of Revelation, uh, that uh, would then be the period of the seven seals. Uh, so our seven ages are the seven letters, then the sixth epoch, uh, which is prepared in its positive form by this Philadelphia age, uh, will be then the seven seals, the last of the seals, the trumpets are brought forward, the seventh uh, seal, and that leads over then to the seventh great epoch of the earth, which again has seven ages, each 2,160 years. And those are the seven trumpets. So if you take the configuration that uh, is depicted in the uh, priest cycle, where he's telling us that uh, since 18... Uh, 40s, humanity as a whole has been crossing the threshold, this middle uh, fourth seal is a depiction of that crossing of the threshold, entering between the pillars of Yahim and Boaz, uh, between the two beasts that later rise, one from the water, the other from the dry land, take up the book and eat it, John is told. There are seven thunders that utter their voices. This is depicted in the 10th and 11th uh, chapters. And uh, the uh, book tastes sweet as honey, but it's bitter in the belly. And Rudolf Steiner, uh, I want to go into this a little more deeply. This uh, I've arranged the seven seals here in a way that shows that there is a Cain and Abel aspect, the head and the heart. The shepherds uh, were more heart-centered. That's where the sacrifice of the lamb, it says in that uh, uh, section of the book of Revelation that there was uh, sort of this tragic atmosphere in the heavens as no one could open the book and loose the seals thereof. And there's 24 elders around the throne. And uh, then you have John uh, sort of breaking into tears, participating in this cosmic tragedy. But then he hears from one of the 24 elders, behold, the lion from the tribe of Judah has succeeded in opening the book and loosening the seals thereof. But when he then looks, he doesn't see the lion, but rather the lamb. This is the sacrificial lamb. This is the Christ who underwent the mystery of Golgotha. He made the future evolution possible. And really also as the logo stands at the foundation of the whole of world evolution, in the beginning was the word and the word was God and all things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. And in him was life and the life was the light of men and the light shineth in the darkness and the darkness comprehendeth it not. So we have to learn to wake up in this realm uh, where we're generally in deep sleep, where these images, these world of imagination is hidden from us. Sleep is the younger brother of death. We have to go through a kind of death and inner rebirth to witness these uh, imaginations on a higher level. And around that throne and the lamb are the four living creatures. Uh, they represent the divine forces that helped to inspire the early group soul development of humanity. And the 24 elders uh, 
they're, th they're sort of around that seal, there is crowns. They throw down their crowns before the lamb. They rule over time. And the Christ in that picture I showed earlier with his hand uh, in the first seal, uh, those seven stars represent the seven stages of evolution. The Christ as the Logos rules over those seven stages. So each of these seals can be meditative on in connection with the days of the week. And over time, they can begin to uh, become windows into the higher astral world. The gist of the book of Revelation, especially at the beginning, is really pointing to the cosmic Christ, the Christ who overcame death, the Alpha and the Omega. And this is the being who prepares the marriage of heaven and earth, as opposed to the divorce of heaven and earth that the adversarial forces are depicting. And in the early esoteric Christian communities, the Christ being was connected with the sun. The, the Christ being the solar logos is the 13th in the midst of the 12 uh, father mother forces that work through the zodiac. And so he in one radiates back out as the 13th, the 12. And this is kind of the, uh, the archetypal ego of uh, the human being that was bestowed by the Christ is really 12 fold, can be seen from 12 different uh, vantage points. This was an uh, excerpt from the esoteric school having to do with the threefold sun. The first is the sun that brings the light that makes visible the physical objects on earth. And in this light is something spiritual that comes from the second sun, which bestows upon us the eye through which we have memory so that we can have a self-contained soul life. Behind this lies something still more spiritual. This is the third sun. The third sun is the sun spirit, Christ. He gives the possibility for the I, which merely exists through the memory, to go from incarnation to incarnation and to attain eternal life. This third sun has been united with the earth ever since the mystery of Golgotha took place. This is the sun which transformed Saul into Paul on the road to Damascus, which he later invoked in the words, not I, but Christ in me. The task of all esotericists must be to grasp more and more this spiritual son, Christ, and to awaken him and sense him ever more strongly within themselves. So Paul was a kind of forerunner. His experience on the road to Damascus is kind of a forerunning of what we in our time can gain uh, by looking up to the second coming of Christ in the etheric. So here again is the threshold image, the fourth seal. And when Steiner spoke of this in the uh, course to the priests on the apocalypse and the Forstant members who were there, he spoke of one can live into this imagination in our time by understanding, living into the imagination that the clouds, which kind of make up the body, of this being who can be seen as a kind of guardian of the threshold is related to the peoples of the East, the cloud people, the thinking people. Because when you cross the threshold, the three soul forces divide. And he says, this same phenomena happens on the macrocosmic level. So you have the peoples of Asia, the Slavic people, the Russian people as a important part of that are then the cloud people that represent this receptivity to cosmic thinking. But in each of these cases, 
there's a one-sidedness that makes uh, these people then vulnerable. So if the thinking is enhanced at the expense of the feeling and the willing, you have a weakened feeling and will life and the thinking then dominates. And he says, for example, that really allowed Bolshevism to come into Russia and uh, sort of in a certain sense undermine the mission. Uh, you know, you had uh, certain occult groups helping with that uh, in the case of the English uh, Freemasons that Steiner speaks of where Trotsky, for example, was helped by the Canadian and also by the English to find his way into Russia. And Lenin was helped uh, by the Germans in a sealed train together with his compatriots to travel to Russia. And there was funding uh, for the right wingers, uh, which certain Anglo-American parties wanted to dominate in Europe and they wanted to export this more leftist uh, Marxist uh, Leninist impulse into Russia where the great experiment with socialism could happen. And so after uh, Lenin, you had like 30 years of Stalin and you think of Stalin, he rivals Hitler as a kind of uh, person who mediated demonic uh, forces. Uh, then you have the uh, people of Middle Europe. He referred to them as the feeling people and the rainbow people uh, related to this seal. And then in the Americas, you have the will people. Uh, there you have the fiery will forces that come up against Ariman who's the adversary within the realm of the will, whereas Lucifer is the adversary in the realm of thinking. So the Asian Eastern people have more of a temptation of Lucifer, whereas in America, it's a geographic area where Ariman, the death forces, the subnature forces are dominant. So a lot of technology spreads from Western Europe and from the Americas, especially where the North-South mountain ranges are which are aligned to the magnetic forces of the earth. You have inspirations for technology such as Silicon Valley, et cetera. And these then spread across the planet like artificial intelligence is doing currently. So you have then in the picture that Steiner gives in the priest course, he says, you can imagine one foot on the Pacific ocean of this being, the red pillar in this case, and the other on the Andes mountains. So that the threshold that we're going through is stretched between the Pacific Ocean and the Andes mountains. The Andes mountains are part of that north-south mountain range as human sacrifices were a part of the Mexican mysteries that also took place among the Incas and other uh, where the anti-sun forces were very much involved. And uh, that was sort of the uh, working of Zorat, the sun demon, that uh, seeks to gain entry into the blood. And uh, someone like Philip LeBel was an agent of those same forces. And you could say Hitler as well in Middle Europe uh, was very much involved in trying to destroy the work that Rudolf Steiner in the service of Michael had uh, been preparing. Uh, so when we cross this threshold, which began in the 1840s in connection with the sounding of the trumpet, this is again a, a consciousness soul interpretation of the book of Revelation, which uh, really places the trumpets in our time. Now, if you remember what I said earlier, the trumpets in the course that Steiner gave in Nuremberg, uh, 2008 or 1908, I should say, uh, those occur in the seventh epoch of the earth. The very end of this uh, earth period would be the sixth and the seventh trumpets. So, 
what's happening is the, the seventh trumpet would lead over to the pralaya, over to the bridge to the New Jerusalem, the golden city. But by giving us this insight that a kind of prelude to that future is happening in our time. This crossing of the threshold, this division of humanity I spoke of the last time is a prelude to the division that will take place at the end of earth evolution when the death of the earth uh, takes place and human beings pass over into uh, Pralaya stage after which there's a reemergence of the new Jerusalem. So uh, that's something to take into account. And when we cross this threshold, there's three gifts. And uh, one of them is then the high eugenic occultism. That's really the gift that's given to the cloud people, the people of the East have a special relationship to that. And then to the Middle European, the uh, rainbow people, we have hygienic occultism, healing occultism. You could say Ita Wegman, uh, whom Steiner worked with very closely in this regard, was one of the uh, persons who embodied the task of developing this hygienic occultism in Middle Europe. And then you have the uh, mechanical occultism and that is more something that belongs to the West. And that uh, is embodied in, uh, at one time Steiner gave uh, indication of human beings who one could relate to the red pillar and the blue pillar, the red blood and the blue blood, the incarnation forces, the excarnation forces. And he uh, showed how Tolstoy could be identified with this Yachim pillar, the red pillar, the incarnation pillar, the birth mysteries. And that's where Lucifer played a role. Uh, it's kind of written into the life of Tolstoy to a certain extent. He was sort of an ascetic individual, but Rudolf Steiner spoke of the power of his thinking that a few pages in Tolstoy's work would take many volumes in what was being written in Middle Europe. But when Bolshevism took hold, he pointed to how now uh, Tolstoy loses his relevance. He's kind of eclipsed by these negative forces. So that's that vulnerability I spoke of earlier, where you can have thinking dominate, but being weak and vulnerable to the adversarial forces taken over down below in the will and the feeling life, where the feeling life in the Slavic Russian people tends to turn back to the old religious heritage of the Orthodox Church, et cetera, which has certain rigid fixed ways of working. On the West, you have John Worrell Keeley as the person who epitomizes that pillar. He was a forerunner of this mechanical occultism. He invented a, a machine that would run uh, through the agency of the human etheric body. Uh, and that is kind of a technology of the future that the occult societies of the West are seeking to wield as a source of power. And that uh, Rudolf Steiner in his mystery play uh, the Strader figure is kind of involved in that quest to create this new moral technology. So each of these gifts uh, involve with hygienic, eugenic, uh, and mechanical occultism have a positive and a negative counterpart. And so that's a deeper uh, subject. So with this collective crossing of the threshold, I again, uh, for time's sake, just want to say that there is this threefold uh, separation that happens to the individual also happening to mankind. 
the understanding that must come to the pupil of spiritual science through his knowledge of what the guardian of the threshold is must come to the whole of modern mankind in regard to the course of civilization. In inner experience, though not in outer consciousness, humanity is passing through the region that can also be called a region of the guardian of the threshold. What is an event of great intensity for the individual enters the world of higher knowledge proceeds unconsciously in present day mankind as a whole. And those who have linked themselves together as anthroposophical community must realize that it is one of the most needed of all things in our days to bring men to understand this passing through the region, which is the threshold. What is an event of great intensity for the individual who enters the world of higher knowledge proceeds unconsciously in present day mankind as a whole and those who have linked themselves together anyways, uh, this is uh, a important event that uh, where even though this began in the 1840s, it continues. This teaching of the threshold still survived in all its concreteness in the time of Aristotle. And we have said a trace can still be found as late as the 19th century. But there we come to an abyss. In the 40s of the 19th century, these things were utterly and completely lost. And the abyss lasted until the end of the 19th century when the coming of the Michael age, the possibility for these truths to be found again. When, however, men step over this abyss, they are really stepping over a threshold and at the threshold stands a guardian. Men were not able to see the guardian when they went past him between the years 1842 and 1879, but now they must for their own good look back and take note of him, or to continue not heeding him and to live on into the following century without heeding him would bring terrible trouble upon mankind. And I think there's a sort of a signs of our time point to us facing these troubles and consequences. And the tragedy is that with this crossing of the threshold, we have a kind of prefiguration, the future is already being prepared. So as I, I said, the, the last of the trumpets, which should leave over from the planet Earth to the future Jupiter condition, where spiritual uh, self uh, spirit self, manas, matures, that's being telescoped into our time in the period from the 1840s uh, where humanity begins to cross the threshold. And so just as in this diagram, you have the danger of succumbing to the eighth sphere, which is a counter evolutionary impulse that Lucifer and Ariman have been preparing. Uh, this has been the case since the um, Lemurian time when the moon separated uh, from the earth uh, through the agency of Yahweh. Uh, the moon is kind of a cosmic cross that Yahweh took upon himself, the hardest forces within the earth and uh, really a sort of dregs of the earth. And yet uh, Yahweh was preparing the birth of the Christ being through the Hebrew people. And at the baptism, that uh, fulfillment was enacted uh, through the agency of John the Baptist aligned with Yahweh and uh, then the Christ could live for three years on the earth, which culminated in the mystery of Golgotha, where the Christ became the sun spirit. And that makes possible the future Jupiter condition, which is the earth becoming a sun. But the eighth sphere is uh, preparing what will become a future satellite that will circle around that future sun where human beings who have neglected to take up the Christ being will 
have missed the opportunity to take him up in the way that was possible during Earth's evolution, and we'll have to wait for a later uh, period. So in each stage of evolution, there's always certain beings that remain behind. On the old moon, when the angels were going through their human stage, only certain of them fulfilled that uh, development and those that are left behind are the Luciferic angels. And yet the mystery of evil is one where we have to redeem it. So the Christ is really the higher ego of humanity as a whole. It's meant to help us to overcome race consciousness. And Christ gave us the golden triangle, which is spirit self, life spirit, spirit man, manas, bodhi, atman. The Christ prepared all three of those future stages and without him, it wouldn't be possible for us to develop to those higher stages. But freedom is really coming to the fore in this consciousness soul age, which makes it a decisive period. So here's kind of a, a depiction of the golden triangle using three of the seals. So you have the woman standing on the moon, crowned with the stars, clothed with the sun, embodying Manas, Michael with the dragon, chained beneath his feet and the key uh, to the higher worlds in his hand. It's also the key to the mystery of good and evil, embodying life spirit or buddhi, the transformed etheric body. Manas is the transformed and purified astral body, also referred to in esoteric Christianity as the Sophia. The Sophia incorporates in the human being once that has reached a certain stage of progress. The Sophia being incorporated in the Maria Sophia being. And then of course, there's the Atman, the spirit self. This is a reunion with the Father God and the mother, father, mother ground, you could say. But to get there, we have to participate in the battle in the heavens. But we're not alone, we have help. There is, uh, according to Rudolf Steiner and others before him, uh, these periods of 2,160 uh, years, during those uh, periods, there are the shorter cycles that last about 350, 354 years. And uh, we're now in a period that began in 1879. And that was uh, really the new age of Michael. And Michael's last rulership was uh, way back in uh, 24, uh, 248 to 602 BC. And that was where Aristotle and uh, the uh, Alexander the Great were very much aligned to that Michael impulse and helped to bring Michael's uh, impulse into that Greco-Latin age, which was helping to prepare for the uh, coming of Christianity. So it's really Michael who can help us with this battle. Uh, anthroposophy is really a Michaelic stream. And it's uh, this picture that Steiner gives of uh, to prepare human freedom, Michael releases his rulership of cosmic intelligence. And this began like in the ninth century, it reached a certain stage in the time of uh, Thomas Aquinas and the uh, others around him who were aligned to Michael at that time. And uh, then you had the Arab stream as a kind of a uh, 
counterpart, the realist and the nominalist uh, that was sort of a earthly reflection of this battle. So when Micah lets go of the cosmic intelligence, it descends like a golden rain to the earth and humanity. But that's also where Ariman can take hold of it. And in this consciousness soul period, uh, the Archangel Michael kind of depicted there, sort of on the left, uh, is pondering what's going on down there. And, you know, you could say that uh, uh, this is the being who's particularly aligned to the human uh, world. And he's let go of cosmic intelligence. And now he has to wait for it to be taken up in human hearts, which is what the foundation stone meditation is about that Rudolf Steiner gave at the Christmas conference. And uh, yet it's out of freedom that this occurs. So this is the sort of the last seal uh, in the middle there. And I've added a few things around it. Uh, the Solomon's temple at the uh, top right, it had uh, three parts. The pillars, you could say, were the legs of the temple, the middle region where the altar of incense uh, was, the 12 showbread, and the seven branch candelabra is the realm of the feelings, that reverence, devotion, uh, et cetera, awe and wonder that prepares at the altar of incense to go through the four colored veil that uh, one had to pass through to enter the Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies was totally gilded in gold and uh, it was a cubical space and there was no light that came into it. Uh, but at the mystery of Golgotha, the veil to that uh, room was rent and torn open from top to bottom and light came into it for the first time. It represents the future, the new Jerusalem. The golden city also has the measurements of a cube. And it's this room that represents thinking so that uh, the uh, salt uh, is really the symbol of thinking in the alchemical trinity of salt, mercury, and sulfur. And Rudolf Steiner uh, worked on this to make it accessible to modern human beings in his threefold understanding of the human being, the nerve sense system, the head pole, thinking pole, the rhythmic system would be the mercurial, feeling pole, mercury, especially involved in uh, the rhythm of heart and lung. And then we had the sulfur related to the fiery metabolic system, which is related to the pillars uh, of the temple. And uh, this seal is also called the grail seal. And the Gertianum can be seen as a kind of grail uh, temple for our time. Here's uh, a little quote taken from the Matthew Gospel where Jesus Christ utters the words, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. So you kind of see a very concentrated uh, image there if you think of salt. I mean, we are the thinking of the earth. And if we don't uh, raise our thinking to this highest potency, then it loses its uh, power to become a source of light. And Moses carried these hermetic mysteries from Egypt to Israel. And Rudolf Steiner spoke of how all matter is in essence light. So the origin of all material reality is divine thinking that was spoken forth in the Logos. 
in this little quote, uh, which was with uh, Countess Kaiserling at the uh, time of the uh, agricultural course, she's asking him, uh, can one then believe that the Grail Castle is really present in the etheric world? Rudolf Steiner, yes, it is really present. I, she then asked the Grail story, the chemical wedding of Christian Rosenkreuz and the Mithras cult are all aware of this castle. Is it the same sacred building that is the Bible is called the New Jerusalem? Rudolf Steiner, the New Jerusalem of which the Bible speaks is the eternal archetypal image of how it will be in the future. The Grail Castle is the image of how it is now in the spiritual world. I won't go into this right now, but it uh, has to do with in uh, the occult science and outline. Uh, Steiner speaks of uh, anthroposophy as the science of the grail. Rudolf Steiner could be seen as an initiate of the grail. So this sort of speaks for itself. This is a painting that was meant to go in the uh, first iteration of the what became the first Gautianum in Munich and later in the uh, building in Dornach, which was tragically burned down. There is a uh, movement from left to right. And you can see on the left, there's the eugenic, the birth mysteries, uh, the father divinity is in the foreground. You have at the bottom, uh, Moses looking back at the burning bush, looking to the past, to that blood lineage. And then opposite Moses, you have Paul, Saul, who became Paul, looking into the future. And there you have the Rosicrucian stages of initiation, and it leads to the pillar on the far right, which is the apocalyptic pillar that has the woman standing on the moon, crowned with the stars, clothed with the sun. And beneath that, we have Michael, the defender of Sophia. And in the middle of the third uh, portion of the triptych is the initiation of Christian Rosenkreuz, where he's saying, in Christo, more and more, so you could say, ex Deo nascimor, in Christo more and more, per spiritum sanctum revivissimus. And on the left side of the mystery of Golgotha, where the tree of life is renewed, you have the Buddha being uh, aligned with the archai, who was governed that period. And on the right side, you have the beloved disciple. Uh, and down below, you have Joseph of Arimathea capturing the blood of the Christ, and it's flowing into the earth. The three mothers who represent old Saturn, old sun, old moon are receiving it. Those are redemptive forces that are transforming the earth. So this is a very deep imaginative picture that uh, one could work with for a long time. So here again is this depiction of the temple in relation to this crossing of the threshold, how the building of Dornach is related to it, uh, the first Gautianum. And in a talk that Steiner gave uh, on the first day of the Christmas conference on Christmas Eve, he gave this sketch on the left and indicated how the ancient Indians, who in other places, he said, were still aligned positively to the hierarchies and had a natural clairvoyance, saw the earth in relation to the human head. And uh, where the head opens up downward to the heart, they saw 
of the earth opening upward to the sun. And this is embodied in a cross section of the Gertianum, this head earth. Steiner indicated that the cerebellum, which would be related in this case to the little cupola, is really uh, the equivalent of the Bodhi tree that uh, uh, Buddha sat under for his enlightenment. It's an organ of uh, clairvoyance when it unfolds in the right way. That means that human beings have to shift their ego from the forehead to the pineal gland that can shine like an inner sun at the center of the head. And that's the equivalent of where the podium was in the Gertianum. So uh, the task we have today, according to Steiner, is to grasp the esoteric in the purest element of thought in mana, spirit self, to comprehend what is spiritual in the finest distillation of the brain is the true mission of our age, to make this thought so powerful that it acquires something of an esoteric strength itself. This is the task that has been set us in order that we may assume our rightful position in the future. And up above uh, in the manifestation of karma, every substance, material substance on the earth is condensed light. What is that light? That is cosmic intelligence, spiritual intelligence. Here you have another picture of that cross section podium being where the pineal gland is. That's the seat of spirit self. The gist of this is that light seen outside is the same thing inside as thinking. This is given in a course on color and light and darkness is a part of that. So he talks there about this connection between thinking microcosmically and light macrocosmically. Here he says the same thing about electricity. And this is where we need to realize that thinking has these two sides. One is the fallen, luciferic, arimonic aspect of thinking that's associated with the subnature forces of electricity and the etheric light ether and life ether and tone ether, et cetera, that uh, have to do with the supernature forces. And here Steiner speaks of modern physics have conjured and juggled about with electricity in a strange way without the least suspicion. They imagine the atom as something electric and through the general state of consciousness of the present time, they forget that whenever they think of an atom as an electric entity, they must ascribe a moral impulse to this atom, indeed to every atom. At the same time, they must raise it to the rank of moral entity. But I'm not speaking correctly, for in ra reality, when we transform an atom into an electron, we do not transform it into a moral but into an immoral entity. Electricity contains, to be sure, moral impulses, moral impulses of nature, but these impulses are immoral. They're instincts of evil, which must be overcome by the higher world. So I, I don't wanna belabor this too much, but uh, last time I went into the Four Horsemen and the descent, the second fall of humanity. And you could say that the, um, the, PC, uh, the inventors of the PC chose the apple with a bite out of it. And they sold the first machines for $666. They knew that humanity was about to take the biggest bite out of the forbidden fruit related to the knowledge of good and evil. And the inventor of the first electronic computer, Alvin Turing, provided a strong hint in this direction when he committed suicide by eating an apple laced with suicide, with, laced with uh, cyanide. 
and we're now in the midst of a period where uh, scientists are talking about transhumanist and post-human evolution, where, uh, as you know, modern science uh, tells us we're just higher animals. But instead of giving us a spiritual orientation, it's now telling us we can conquer death by uploading or downloading ourselves into a uh, robot computer. Uh, this is a kind of illusory quest for immortality inspired by the Luciferic and Arimonic forces. And we kind of stand between these forces in our development. There's on the one hand, the fourfold nature of the human being as it's described in spiritual science. Then we have how it's described in the human uh, world that modern science depicts where it's these higher aspects are left out and the same as the cosmos. So we have these imaginations we've been working with, but modern science gives birth to science fiction rather than seeing the heavenly world uh, behind the stars as the soul spiritual world. They're talking about aliens and mm -hmm. wanting to go to Mars and create colonies and there and on the moon, etc. This is not exactly what we're called to in the way that the book of Revelation uh, tells us uh, through these imaginations. In fact, every stage of evolution, something remains behind. Lucifer remained behind in the old moon, Ariman and the old sun, the Azuras uh, way back in the old Saturn. And these represent a kind of counter trinity and they're the ones that give rise to the eighth sphere. And it's through the 666 cycle, especially, uh, that they seek to achieve this. Uh, that's the number of the sun demons, uh, cyclical development. And so we have the five point star pointing upward that you can kind of imagine the human being standing in that. That's the overcoming of the dragon and the woman standing on the moon, but the counterpart to that is the whore of Babylon who rides on the beast with seven heads and 10 horns, which represent a kind of regression back to the group soul that gave rise uh, during the Atlantean period. And we're meant to overcome and create a new kind of community that's not based on blood. So I've shared this on numerous occasions. It's an attempt to show that the real battle is here on the earth in terms of incarnated human souls. And yet in order to get a full picture of the human being macrocosmically, we have to take into account those who are between death and rebirth, who are migrating through the planetary spheres. So first, it's the moon sphere where purgatory uh, takes place. Uh, that's the satellite around the earth. And we spend a considerable time there, about a third of the time we spent in our past incarnation, weaning ourselves of the attachment and then going through the planets that are closest to us. And then finally, the threshold into the higher heavenly regions, which is through the sun sphere that leads to Mars, uh, Jupiter and Saturn. So we have then this battle that I showed the Goetheanums thought to sort of embody this head aspect, which is related to the salt and the cubical room in the Solomon's temple. And that uh, this is really where the battle lies that we're especially called to participate in. And there were some visionaries uh, some of them looked at this more from a scientific vantage point. Uh, Tyler de Chardin uh, could be seen as someone who had clairvoyant experiences and 
uh, was one of the uh, authors of this understanding of the emergence of the new sphere, which can be seen as a thinking sphere around the earth, so that uh, you don't only have the uh, biosphere, the hydrosphere, and uh, you know the Earth's various uh, layers, the lithosphere, the geosphere. We have a new layer that's been emerging for some time that is really generated by human beings. And this is really a beginning of creating a kind of nervous system through our computer uh, system in the World Wide Web, but that's a subnature counterpart to an etheric phenomena related to the second coming and the Michael impulse uh, that's happening in the etheric in supernature. So we're embracing collectively a subnature counterpart a kind of counterfeit. And we're really called to raise our thinking into the imaginative sphere, inspiration, intuition to reunite with the hierarchies. Uh, but uh, modern science is leading us down into the subnature world. And a big, powerful impulse in that direction, aside from harnessing electricity was uh, in 1945, the uh, first nuclear uh, use of uh, atomic weapons and that later gave rise to the hydrogen bomb as well. So here's where I ended the last time. And I think uh, this is then connected with the seventh trumpet in the priest uh, course, this would be in the Nuremberg cycle, the very at last of the trumpets that leads over to the New Jerusalem, but it's telescoped into our time. It overlights our time. And you could say this is the birth of Christ in his second coming. And the dragon represents uh, the forces of race, the seven root races that go back to the Atlantean period that need to be overcome blood relationship as a source of community is an unconscious bond and more and more will lead to conflict. The dark side of this emerged, especially during the Second World War with the Nazis and the Jews and the persecution back then. And uh, we have kind of a new round of this happening in our time. So it's really this Michael age has dawned, hearts are beginning to have thoughts, enthusiasm no longer flows from mystical obscurity, but from the inner clarity that thought conveys. To grasp this is to receive Michael into one's soul. Thoughts that today seek to grasp the spirit must spring from hearts that beat for Michael as the fiery cosmic prince. These are some artistic expressions that uh, Cindy, my wife, uh, made this little blanket while our son Julian was uh, in the womb and she did something for each of the children. And this on the right is one of the uh, windows in the chapel at Kahumana where the little golden uh, circles represent the configuration of the stars and the sign of Virgo. So in the Matthew gospel, there's kind of a mini apocalypse that talks about the wise and foolish virgins. The wise virgins are those who purify the soul and look up to this woman standing on the moon. You could say the stars are like the handle of the lamp. The uh, radiant heart forces are then the, the lamp itself that uh, conquers these dragon forces. But there's older Eastern methods that seek to rise into the spiritual world and that bypass the impulse that the Christ gave. So these are the foolish virgins who raise their consciousness to the spiritual heights, but uh, 
do not recognize the significance of the Christ event. So here's showing how the grail plays a part. Let us place before ourselves the mother thought of as a virgin with Christ in her lap. And let us then make the statement, he who can have feelings of holiness before this image, he feels himself to be standing before the grail, the holy chalice, the moon mother, now touched by Christ, the new Eve, bearer of Christ, the sun spirit, outshines all other lights. And there you have a painting of Claude de Herbois depicting this. 50 days after Easter, you have the Pentecost event where the Christ who was outside now enters into the inner life of the disciples. This includes as part of it, the redemption of Lucifer. Lucifer becomes, you could say, the source of those fiery flames of enthusiasm that rise above the heads of the disciple. But in the middle, this birth has to pass through the Sophia being who's anchored by the Maria. And you can remember how the beloved disciple is told, behold, this is your mother. And to the mother, behold, this is your son. So he underwent this kind of a baptism of fire already beneath the cross. Here again, I, I had this the last time, beginning with the earth phase of evolution, the wisdom of the outer cosmos becomes an inner wisdom in the human being. Internalized in this way, it becomes the seed of love. Wisdom is a prerequisite for love. Love is the result of wisdom that has been reborn. And the moon as the pearl of great price. Now we know the moon is the place of purgatory. It's the place of purging and a detachment from the earth. The astral body is being purified in order to prepare it to ascend into the heavenly regions. And this has a macrocosmic dimension. If you remember, the book of Revelation has 12 gates and each of them is a pearl. And you could say that this pearl, which is gains its beauty through suffering, is related to what the moon is in the cosmos. And you could say that uh, Sophia, whose name is Wisdom, has within her wisdom all of these 12 vantage points, which are part of what arises out of this pearl of great price out of this development of the moon. The moon is related to silver. Silver is related to the mirror, not just the mirror outside, but the mirror of consciousness, the human thinking brain. So we have to raise our thinking to a higher level where the moon becomes the vessel for the sun, the grail vessel. And the sun then uh, unites all 12 vantage points, not to mention the seven stages of inner feeling and soul development. So you could say that Christ as the Logos is also the divine architect and sacred geometry can help us to grasp some secrets related to the building of the new Jerusalem. This is a depiction of the squaring of the circle. That square has the same perimeter measurement as that circle. And as you can see, that square encompasses the earth and the circle encompasses both the earth and the moon. And if you take this a step further, this is a, a kind of seal that uh, my wife Cindy and I worked on many years ago at Kahumana. Here's some of the geometry that relates to this theme. And here's a picture of how uh, this woman, uh, the virtues of the Sophia, there being 12 virtues. There's actually 12 Easter's that uh, then the Platonic year, you divide it into 12, you get 2,160 years. Uh, the mystery of Golgotha began in the sign of Aries. 
now we are uh, since 18, uh, 1413, the Piscean age, there's a thousand year approximately lag time between when the constellation arrives in the heaven and it arrives in a cultural age on the earth. But we're moving towards the future Aquarian age, the age of Philadelphia, the age of brotherhood, we're called to prepare. We're another virtue of the Christ. In that time, Easter will have behind the sun at the vernal equinox, the sign of Aquarius. Now it has the sign of Pisces. Previously, it had the sign of Aries. The New Jerusalem is really turning time into space and seeing all of those 12 stages together. And this, uh, to move towards this, there's actually uh, 12 gates to the New Jerusalem. There's 12 of these gifts that are given to humanity and virtues of the Sophia and the Christ that will be given through these 12 Easter's that will help us on our way to the New Jerusalem, the building of the Golden City. And we can participate in that by recognizing that we're moving around the earth and that if we turn time into space, we get a cosmic cross related to the solstices and the equinoxes. And these are the four points in the year where you have the longest day, the shortest uh, uh, day, the longest night. And then you have the equinoxes where there's a balance between the two. And they're related to the yearly, is related to the daily cycle. And we can live into these rhythms. Living into the rhythm is a way of entering the etheric world. We have to learn to enter into the world of time as opposed to the world of space in the way that we usually are imprisoned in space. Without living into time, we can't enter the etheric world where the Christ is now present in the etheric. And there are four gateways to the new sun mysteries of Christ. And these are the guardians to those four mysteries that uh, are related to the four main festivals. And there's really, you could say, uh, then four, uh, three of these fourfold crosses in this uh, period from uh, Aries to our present time where the sun is in Pisces at Easter to the Sophian age, the Aquarian age, when the constellation of Aquarius is behind the vernal sun. So that you could say in our time, it's the sun principle, uh, the, so, the Sophian principle will come to the fore, an aspect of the Holy Spirit in the next age. And I wanna stop uh, with that, uh, celebrating the festivals, celebrating uh, entering these four gateways, understanding that the earth is a garden that was made sacred through the mystery of Golgotha, and that the earth is on its way to becoming the future sun, but we have to participate. And the way to participate is especially on the group level, uh, creating these new communities is celebrating the festivals together. And when that becomes contagious, then anthroposophy will reach a new stage of its development. It can be celebrated through the arts, through music, through drama. We need to create a new world culture that's based on what's universally human. It's not based on blood relationship, but rather recognizing that within each human being, there's a divine uh, aspect that can be called forth through seeing through to the higher in the other and community building in circles where we have conversations around themes like what was covered today. Thank you very much. Florian, thank you so much for your super intense presentation, meaningful presentation.
Um, I'm wondering if you can take uh, maybe two or three minutes break. So and let Florian. Can you get closer to your microphone, Andre? Yeah, to let, to let Florian restore his voice and uh, we will stretch our limbs and have a sip of water. So three minutes, dear friends, and we will back with your questions. Would you take a break? Yeah. No. No. I just have a question for Andre. No. Hi, yes. Is my mic better? Dick? Yes, excellent. Uh, yeah, I adjusted. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Cynthia? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, I just had, number one, I have a question for you, Andre. Is this going to be sent out to us so we can watch it again? Because there's no way to take in all this wonderful material and see all the beautiful images that Florian has put together for us. And um, I know it came to me through the Faust branch in Sacramento. Yeah. And there was... There were a lot of people this morning who couldn't be watching that are hopeful too that it will be sent out for people or in some way uh, we would appreciate it because uh, I, I just want to thank Florian because it's a amazing lifetime I feel of him taking in all this information and presenting it in a way that for me answered a lot of my questions that I've been pondering uh, for quite a while. Uh, mm -hmm. and diagrams are so, you know, the two Johns, I think I finally got it straight, thanks to Florian, <laughs> because that was a big one for me, that I knew they both had to be under the cross uh, to have the mystery of Golgotha happen. 
but I couldn't figure out how. So I kept thinking maybe Mary Magdalene was the Abel stream and he, you know, John, but this makes perfect sense. And anyway, so Florian, really just, this is a huge heartfelt thank you. Uh, and uh, I might need 20 more years to take it all in, but you know, we'll see how much time I have. <laughs> yeah, let's, let me, let me answer first part of your question. So it seems yeah. that, so we have website of our branch and um, and program page. So a uh, page of program committee is this huge library okay. of, of presentations. So oh. we are we are close to hundred or maybe even more than hundred, and you can find all presentations of Florian recorded right there. So you can use a link, click on it, and please subscribe uh, on our to our uh, YouTube channel, so as well. Oh, a YouTube channel? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, it's, uh, uh, yeah, all Florian's presentations as well as issues of many of our wonderful Bye. speakers are there. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, and uh, looks like we're going to do like uh, part three. Am I right, Florian? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, good. Thank you. <laughs> oh. Okay, dear friends, I mean, you know how to raise your uh, hand. It's um, if you navigate your cursor in the bottom on your screen. So there is reactions. Reactions. If you click on reactions, it will, will be raise hand button. So, yes, please do so. And we will. We will start chronologically with Valdemar. Well, can you make yourself visible, Valdemar? Yes. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Florian, uh, for your extraordinary work. Uh, I would like to call the attention to just one small detail of your lecture. You mentioned transhumanism. One of its aspects is that uh, uh, we'll be able to download the contents of uh, computer storage into our memory or into our brain, and uh, vice versa, uploading our memory to a computer. Compute the computer will do the calculations and then we'll download the results into our memory and so on and so forth. This is one of the silliest uh, uh, considerations, ideas that could, uh, could uh, occur nowadays. Why? Because for this, it would be necessary to know the code that is used by the brain. Without this code, without knowing this code, it's impossible to read it, say, right? Mm -hmm. And I have a very strong hypothesis consideration, proposal. Uh, there is no code in our brain. Uh, science doesn't know how our brain works. And I say that it will never know using the current scientific methods because there is no code in our brain. <clears throat> is that clear? <clears throat> yeah, I think uh, based on studying Rudolf Steiner's work, uh, you could... Uh, say that one image I brought of the human being stretched out over the cosmos that includes uh, those between incarnation uh, on earth, which is limited to the head uh, in this case, and then those that are migrating in the planetary spheres where they're among the hierarchies, that uh, there is, uh, just like the human being has what Steiner calls a doppelganger. He spoke of this, especially in the second lecture of the geographic medicine uh, course. And there he speaks of how the uh, all sort of illnesses, physical and psychological are due to the double, uh, the luciferic more with the psychological illnesses, the arimonic more to physiological illnesses and that uh, this double is the sheath through which 
the adversarial forces can enter the human being and it's made up of bioelectromagnetic forces within our organism. And of course, uh, the nervous system has its uh, focal point in the head, uh, the nerve sense system, as Steiner calls it. And that uh, the frustration that Steiner describes is that this double enters the human being just before uh, birth. And that the frustration is that this being has to leave just before death. But the ambition of these beings is not to have to leave at just before death. And so they're seeking to seduce us through this counterfeit version of uh, immortality uh, that really would allow them to take the part of us that is related to the kind of shadowy thinking that Ariman has a kinship to through the threshold already a lot of that uh, thinking is embodied in the memory banks, et cetera, of uh, the computer system, just like Steiner talks about libraries as the citadel of Ariman. So Ariman wants to preserve our work. Uh, uh, after we die, we leave that behind. He can then use it for the next generation of technology, so to speak. But the uh, picture that Steiner gives in the future is that there will come a time when this shadowy thinking will take on a life of its own. This is when the moon no longer protects us from the eighth sphere. And this happens around the seventh millennium. And that uh, then uh, if we haven't uh, raised our thinking to these new spiritualization of intelligence that Michael is seeking to inspire and awaken and yet we stand in freedom before it, uh, that it will take on a life on the physical plane, these shadow thoughts, and they will come to a certain degree of life that stands between the present mineral and plant stage. He speaks of spider-like beings who will crowd the earth and that those human souls who have a kinship with these beings will have to incarnate into their midst. And, at a certain point, he gives uh, an impression of how these beings interweave with each other, and he uses the, the name of the caduceus. And this is, of course, something that's close to the, the way the DNA uh, molecule with its uh, sort of interweaving. So there's ambitions to create a DNA computing system, just like there is ambitions to create biocomputing, where they're using actual living substances uh, to develop uh, computers in petri dishes and, and the like, and uh, that's been worked on. And then there's optical computing, aside from electrical computing, in order to overcome Moore's law. So there's a lot of developments, but I agree with you that it's, uh, it's not possible to really upload the true human uh, consciousness. Uh, that's sort of uh, the result of identifying us just with our bodies and that we're just our brains, we're just higher animals and we will have the danger of sinking into the subhuman. And uh, that future kind of is a warning uh, to us that Steiner speaks of so that we have to help to build this new Jerusalem, this golden city, which is really the sun itself is radiates thoughts. Light is thinking in the wider universe, but the fallen light is electricity. And that's what these people are working with, with all of their programming and all of that. They're, we're very proud of those accomplishments and that's Lucifer in us. Okay, thank you very much. Well, Dave, who's next? Dave, could you please unmute your machine? And, um, yeah. Yes. <clears throat> First of all, I want to thank you all for, I'm so grateful everyone's here. I'm so grateful I'm here. 
because um, we all have a certain range of life. And uh, it, I didn't think I'd live so long as to see Steiner's insights really manifest on earth. And um, yeah, I only have words of gratitude and awe for the insights you all bring to what Steiner had spoken of and had visited and uh, reported on because he was an extraordinary reporter. And uh, Andre, I, I really appreciate the art that you brought to the lectures because those things are so, you know, what is it? A picture says a thousand words and uh, your, your artwork and your wife's artwork, I, I want to express my gratitude too. But basically I just wanted to thank you all for having these things and, and thank you so much for making them available through the site because they are worthy of repeating. And if there's anybody that I can share them with, I know we like to sit around with our popcorn and watch them. So I, I really appreciate your, your efforts. Thank you very much, Dave. Thank you, and thank you, Andre. Yeah, um, well, I mean, more questions, dear friends. I know, I mean, it's a super intense uh, presentation. If it's no questions, I will have one statement. Mm -hmm. So, and it relates to light, uh, but I'm afraid this will be too long. Uh, so I will, I will talk about human intelligence and ability to think. And there is um, an important lecture, uh, which is part of karmic cycle. This is lecture number 11 from volume number three of karmic relationships. And you probably know this lecture because one of illustrations of this lecture, this is uh, life of uh, Friedrich Nietzsche. You probably recognize. So, and it's uh, kind of incredible uh, because it speaks about nature of uh, cosmic intelligence and ability to think because uh, uh, um, a cosmic intelligence named by Rudolf Steiner as totality of angelic beings. And those totality of angelic beings, they are beings which are separated from uh, angelic kingdom, which is ruled by Michael, he went toward the earth. So speaking by simple language, they are fallen angels. And fallen angels, which they have uh, Arimanic orientation, so they are ruled by Ariman. So uh, ability to think or to have this intelligence are provided or empowered by uh, Arimanically oriented angelic beings according to Rudolf Steiner in this karmic cycle. This karmic cycle is, uh, is uh, you know, it's 1924. It's one of the latest. And uh, uh, so it's kind of interesting because when human being totally relaxed, so thinking is running, and it's running like in very negative manner. Mostly, according to Rolf Steiner, it can be some kind of sexuality because uh, they are inspiring human beings, those angels, uh, in Gabrielic manner which is previous archangelic being to Michael. And uh, speaking about Michaelites, who were members of the Anthroposophical Society, the story is, uh, according to law of incarnation, each of uh, spiritual pupils, or each of Michaelites, should grab part of uh, cosmic intelligence, which is existing in the form of this fallen angel, and, uh, and use it, but use it in a good manner. <laughs> so uh, Michaelite has two angelic beings. One is uh, angelic beings, which is still existing and totally devoted to Michael. So, and second, this is something which is empowering thinking during earthly incarnation. And this particular situation, when you have two angels, one is uh, who is uh, running your thinking, and second, who is inspiring you in 
Michaelic manner. So it creates certain illness. It's creating certain split in human soul. And then it's an uh, ingenious uh, uh, statement of Rudolf Steiner. In this particular split, must be resolved, must be fixed by spiritual development. So it, I think it's, it's absolutely interesting and uh, fascinating because we have to recognize it. So uh, many of human abilities um, are given by fallen beings, but human being working with fallen angel thinking right type of thoughts or thinking facts of spiritual world and through this particular act he returns fallen angel again into Michaelic kingdom so i just wanted to mention that so and i have some ideas about light which is also kind of uh <laughs> yes uh source in the fallen human being and lucifer so, but looks like it's going to be too long. Thank you, Andre. I'm, I'm done. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, so. I think uh, uh, would in the future add a, a part three, and we'll see how that goes uh, as to beyond that. But uh, we could. Look, look towards that as a next step in this same theme. Yeah, yeah. Just I just just wanted to add. So, uh, in relation to Friedrich Nietzsche, Friedrich Nietzsche, you know that Friedrich Nietzsche uh, has a previous incarnation of a uh, Catholic monk, uh, and he did. I mean, self punishment. Can you just uh, describe how it, when person is weeping himself? I'm sorry. So, which led to like you know very very deep incarnation. So, as balance, Nietzsche was in his Nietzsche incarnation. He was incarnated very very shallow. <clears throat> so, and uh, one of angelic beings, which are described by Steiner, and I just described it right now, um, took over, and it's uh, and it's it's it shows in. Uh, in, uh, um, in uh, writings of uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, such as Ecke Homa, for example, or Antichrist. So, yeah, the angelic beings, which is need to be like used as force, which is empowering thinking, took over completely with some kind of very negative tendencies, this thing. All right, uh, and George is next. Yours, George. Uh, thank you. Um, Florian, while we're talking about beings, I wondered if you could help clarify the relationship between the unholy trinity and anthroposophy and the sorret and the dragon and the two beasts that appear in the book of Revelations. So the dragon is cast out of heaven onto earth and the beast that rise out of the water gets its power from the dragon that's cast down to earth. And then, of course, you've also got the beast that arises from the land and with the two horns and is related to the number 666, which is the Sorat. And yet mm -hmm. I remember reading that Steiner said that the Sorat has jurisdiction over Araman and Lucifer. Can you shed any light on the anthroposophical terms and the beasts that appear in the book of Revelation and the dragon? Yeah, so I think uh, you have uh, the dragon that appears in relation to the woman standing on the moon crowned with the stars and clothed with the sun. That's a Luciferic uh, dragon that harkens back to the Atlantean time. So Steiner describes how the ten horns have to do with the, the first four uh, heads are related to the four group soul that are the four living creatures that you see in the second uh, 
seal, for example. And that's before the division of the sexes. So those heads only have one horn. But after that, there's a division of the sexes. And uh, that leads to the remaining uh, heads having two horns. Uh, so together, then the 10 horns. And that beast, Lucifer, tends to lead backward into the past. He doesn't really want uh, to accept Earth evolution. He wants to have humanity remain in the three previous stages. And yet Lucifer's karma is Ariman. So the when Steiner de, de speaks of how Michael, the defender of Sophia, this dragon wants to devour the child that's about to be born, but the child is taken up onto the throne and uh, the dragon is then cast down after a battle. And this is what's depicted in that period from the 1840 to 1879 for our time. It keeps repeating itself. This dragon is then cast down and then enters into the human unconscious and finds its way into human thinking in terms of the Luciferic pride, etc. But as it's cast down, Lucifer's karma is Ariman. So when Steiner speaks of these spirits of darkness, he speaks of them as being Arimanic. And uh, the, the other uh, dragon who uh, is the two-horned that dry, comes out of the dry land is more the Arimanic dragon that is closely connected with the Zorat being. He's more, his connection is with the mineral kingdom in particular. He would uh, like to not go back into the past, but he would like to actually uh, isolate humanity within the mineral kingdom, but especially the machine world that he helps to inspire. So uh, the sun demon uh, could be seen as the real antichrist. Now Christ is the sun being and uh, Zorat is uh, the anti-sun being. And so, so is Zorat, are you equating the Zorat with Araman? He works uh, through Ariman, uh, works through this two-horned beast that has this Arimanic character. He's uh, sort of uh, just as one hears how uh, the second beast kind of is more hidden in the background. Mm -hmm. He looks like a, a, can look like a lamb, but he speaks like a dragon, and he gives power to the first beast. So the first beast. Uh, the Luciferic beast attacks more human thinking the, and uh, awakens pride and selfishness. And uh, the Arimanic attacks more through the feet, through the lower will, the Arimanic, uh, where we touch the earth. And uh, that uh, seeks to rise up uh, into the human thinking. If we have the Christ being in the heart, he can't take hold of the thinking. But generally speaking, Ariman only rises as high as the human sexual nature and pulls the thinking down to serve the lower nature. But if the Christ is there in the human heart, that's not possible. And uh, between Zorat and Ariman are the Azuric beings. So the Lucifer is the counterpart to the Holy Spirit in the unholy trinity, Ariman, uh, the Christ or the Son principle, and the Azuric beings to the Father principle. They remain behind on old Saturn. And they attack uh, the ego itself. So Rudolf Sander indicated that the Luciferic uh, intervention was mainly in the astral body and that the progressive hierarchies to counter that brought illness 
into human evolution and ultimately death. Whereas for the arimonic intervention, which is more in the etheric body, hardening our thinking, rigidifying it, etc., cetera, uh, the countermeasure there was reincarnation and karma. But he says in terms of the Azuric attack, which only begins in our time, it attacks the very ego of the human being and it does it through sexuality uh, and the lower nature. And so do you, do you equate the dragon that's cast out of heaven with the first beast that rises yes. out of the water? Yes. Right, okay. And the Azuras aren't really mentioned. No, I don't. Uh, you don't really have them depicted in the Book of Revelation, but uh, there's this one anthroposophist uh, that I can't recall where, but I agree with it, is that if you take the sculptural group that Steiner uh, had intended to be at the back of the Goetheanum stage as the focal point, the new embodiment of the mystery of evil, and there was an imagination of the same uh, in the cupola above, that uh, if the Christ is not there in between those two adversaries to bring about balance, a dynamic balance, then the, the Luciferic is the feminine double, the Arimonic is the masculine double, mm -hmm. and the Azuric beings then creep in between where the Christ belongs, and they bring about the antithesis of love, so that instead of uh, love being sacramentalized between the sexes, you have the Azuric beings bring about a perversion of the love. They bring it, turn it downward into the abyss and there it becomes sadomasochism. Uh, and uh, then that's the beginning of gray and ultimately leads over to black magic. Mm -hmm. So that uh, the uh, sun demon works through uh, these three uh, and you could say stands higher. His evolution didn't begin within our earthly uh, cycle of uh, old Saturn, old sun, etc. And that uh, he seeks to usurp Christ's uh, rulership as the so-called king of kings uh, of the earth. And so he uh, comes for the first time at 666, uh, the first intervention. The middle of the fourth post Atlantean period is 333. And Christ comes 333 years before that in order to counterbalance what's coming in 666. And of course, the 666 is uh, blunted by the rise of Islam right at that time. And so the next time is in the uh, uh, 14th century uh, where the Knights Templar is Philip LaBelle are part of that drama. But the third 666 cycle is 1998, uh, which is closer to our own time. And it's not that one year, it's kind of like an earthquake has an epicenter. It sends its shocks into both the past and the future. So Hitler was, uh, you could say, possessed by this uh, Zorat uh, power. And uh, like we were just uh, told by Andre, Rudolf Steiner spoke of how more and more souls like Nietzsche was among the first uh, to succumb to the Arimanic sort of incorporation, but Zorat, uh, works through Ariman uh, most powerfully and the Azuric uh, beings who are now beginning to come to the fore. Good, thank you. But it's a complicated subject and uh, I don't claim to have all the answers there either. It's an ongoing process. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Jeanette. Who's next? I was wondering what is the countermeasure to the attack on the ego? Well, that's the taking the Christ uh, into the human ego 
And if you think of this picture of the uh, pineal gland uh, in uh, one of Steiner's lectures, he points out like we have this metamorphosis of the human being where uh, what was there in our whole body metamorphoses into the head of the next incarnation. Well, so he says that the heart of this incarnation will become the pineal gland of our next incarnation. The pineal gland is located at the center of the head and it's related to the sun forces uh, as an organ, as opposed to the pituitary gland, which has more a lunar quality and more governs form. Like you have dwarfism, giantism is related to that organ. But these are also spiritual organs and that uh, in the etherization of the blood, one could imagine a kind of lemniscate between the head and the heart. And the pineal gland is the center of one uh, of that uh, pole of the lemniscate and the heart is the center of the other. And all of the 12 senses, uh, their nerves head towards the pineal gland. Uh, there's an interesting article, uh, The Grail and the Human Brain, that uh, is worth studying in that regard. Uh, so that we have a, a miniature little uh, macrocosm of the 12 forces of the zodiac and the sun as the pineal gland. And that the, uh, this taking in the uh, anthroposophical world of thoughts which is really the gift of the Holy Spirit, the angels are weaving into our astral body imaginations. We have to raise ourselves to receive them so that uh, they don't turn into their opposite, which he says in the angels weaving into the astral body. But this etherization of the blood is a path towards participating in the second coming of Christ in the etheric so that the blood of Christ was etherized and is there in the atmosphere of the earth. And as we begin to uh, take in this nourishment, this Michael impulse into our hearts and our hearts can begin to shine. And this is related to developing compassion for other human beings. Empathy is a way of escaping the prison of the body and feeling our larger self as a karmic circle that includes other people that we're related to. And it's uh, the Christ who then says, uh, where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there in the midst of them. So this is kind of a protection, you could say against, uh, by having the true ego awaken within the human being that begins in the forehead with this two petal lotus uh, that has to do with clear thinking Anthroposophy schools that clear thinking. If we take in that food regularly, it can help uh, to nurture this inner sun. Michael wants to take up his residence in the human heart, where we hear in that one slide I shared of hearts that beat for Michael. Michael is the countenance of Christ. Michael is the one who does battle with these adversarial forces. And uh, the Azuric uh, beings uh, are the antithesis of love, which is the mission of the earth. So developing love. And in that one uh, slide where I showed how absorbing wisdom gives birth to love and purifying the soul uh, gives us an affinity to the Sophia being, the source of wisdom. And then we can become like the lamp that shines. And uh, uh, then there's another shining in the head from the pineal gland that's the counterpart. So if the earth becomes the temple, the body of the human being can also become the temple. And then uh, these beings don't have access. So we're then fulfilling the archetypal call that the book of Revelation is uh, showing as our uh, development and what our goals are. 
What's the most practical way to do this? Or are there just many, many, many ways of doing this? Well, I think one motivation is where Steiner says, unlike the Luciferic and Aridamic attacks, uh, the, Luc the Azuric attack is not redeemable. They tear parts of the ego out. So if we understand that love is the mission of the earth, it begins on the lowest level with gender love. Uh, the mission of the future is to transform gender love into uh, this future procreation with the larynx. So how we use our words, how we speak, what we choose out of our thoughts to speak, whether we speak from the heart, speaking and listening belong together. So conversation, like in Goethe's fairy tale, is more precious than gold. So having a circle of people to have conversations with in a study group, uh, that's a path of developing higher love. And in relationships, uh, raising them to a higher level, gender relationship, uh, you know, is sacramentalized in marriage. And the archetypal masculine and feminine have their shadow side with Lucifer and Ariman. So we need to get to know those adversaries and help each other uh, to where it's not just us being on a path, but we want to help each other, especially in the circle of people that we know, to help to call forth their higher self, to look past their double and their shadow. And that's in our closer relationships, uh, we have that kind of work uh, to do as well. But, uh, you know, this, this path of love, uh, Jung gives some interesting insights where he says that the, this is a psychologist, C.G. Jung, uh, where we have a persona, the personality, which is conditioned and shaped by the outer conditioning that we've grown up into. And then we have the self. But to arrive at the self, we first have to own our own shadow because the persona casts a shadow. Steiner sp speaks about the doppelganger, the lower self that we bring with us from past incarnations, like a packet we have to take with us, like our suitcase when we travel. And uh, that kind of holds us back but we have to own it. We have to avoid just being self-righteous and identifying with uh, uh, all our ideals and leaving out the fact that evil isn't just out there. We have it within ourselves. We need to redeem Lucifer. Lucifer becomes the Holy Spirit. And uh, this redemption of uh, this lower self uh, is in Jung's term. He says we have to own the double, redeem the double, and through that, we gain a connection to the contrasexual opposite, which is to begin with hidden in the unconscious. So for a man, it has an anima. For a woman, she has an animus. And it's only by uh, creating a kind of marriage between our uh, masculine nature and our uh, anima that the self arises but the self is hidden in the unconscious to begin with in this contrasexual opposite. So we have to, instead of changing genders as uh, this gender fluid kind of uh, mentality that's pervasive in our time, this has to do with the loosening of the ether body. The ether body has the opposite sex to our physical and the ether body is loosening. So this opposite gender is coming out and what we need to do is incorporate that like a being like Novalis was a masculine person, but had this love for his inner feminine counterpart that was helped by his meeting Sophie and his former incarnations as uh, John the Baptist, as Raphael, etc. And as Raphael, this looking up at the eternal feminine with his paintings, etc. So uh, there's a lot to learn from uh, individuals like uh, Novalis, Raphael, and uh, 
than uh, C.G. Jung's picture there of getting in touch with the contrasexual opposite. And yet we still need to remain true to uh, what we're incarnated in as a physical body because that's what karma has uh, chosen for us. And if we defy karma, then there's consequences that will show up. So anyways, uh, that's part of the picture uh, that I can share with you at the moment. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Lauren. So dear friends, so uh, yeah, I think it's a good time to, to round and finish our uh, presentation. We're working for two hours and um, 20 minutes. So, dear Florian, thank you so much. When do you think we will come down with part three? Next think, month? Uh, yeah, within a month, I would say. Yeah, makes sense. So let's keep it all closer to each other in terms of time. Okay, dear friends, yeah, thank you for participation. Dear Florian, thank you so much for your hard work and such a meaningful presentation. Dear friends, please unmute your machine and say big thank you to Florian. Thank you, Florian. Thank you, Florian. Thank, thank you, Florian. Thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, so thank so thank you all. Yes. Just amazing. Thank you. Okay. Goodbye, all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.